Okay, so welcome everyone. This is uh, March the 17th and in this week's session, we are very pleased to welcome John Hill from Northeastern University. John has a very illustrious career in model risk management. Uh, we both have uh, many common affiliations. I think uh, City is one of the most common affiliations. So we both are from the City Alumni Network. Um, we both have uh, academic positions at different universities and uh, we both teach model risk management in various capacities. So I'm a big admirer of uh, John's work and uh, all the immense experience and knowledge he has in uh, various areas. And uh, he loves to share all his uh, you know, amazing thinking. And I thought this would be a good session for us to listen to John on what his thoughts are and how uh, model risk management is going and how uh, he's been thinking about various aspects about uh, various uh, innovations in model risk management. Uh, we're also waiting for uh, Krishna Gade, who's uh, the founder of Fiddler, and uh, uh, hopefully he's gonna join us uh, in a little bit. And in today's session, uh, we're gonna have a couple of themes. We'll talk about uh, model risk management in general and the various innovations that are happening. And in the fireside chat at the end, uh, I'll give you the opportunity as the audience to ask any questions from, uh, you know, from your perspective on what you're seeing in the context of model risk management and uh, how you're seeing machine learning and model risk management evolve as more and more model risk management gets adopted in the industry. So let me share a couple of slides before we get started. <clears throat> for people who are joining us for the first time, Welcome, uh, we are Quant University. We are based out of Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, we have been uh, working on various uh, problems in data science, machine learning, and quantity finance uh, since 2013. We started out as a, a consulting advisory. We have worked with large asset management companies. Uh, we have provided uh, uh, due diligence services for various organizations. And uh, when we started enabling various companies on what the power of machine learning and AI is, uh, one of the things we observed was, was this knowledge gap on how do you enable uh, the workforce who have been you know, building statistical and quantitative models, and now they're trying to bring in new technologies for various financial uh, modeling practices. And that's where uh, we started focusing on educational programs. So we have multiple programs we offer through Quant University. Uh, in the last year, most of these programs have been made available online. Uh, we partner with organizations like Premier and uh, We've also done some programs for the CFA Institute and uh, we have uh, uh, made uh, various programs available to various societies uh, throughout the world. Uh, we are also building a platform called as the QSandbox to make uh, experimentation easier when you build out quantitative models and everything is running on Amazon. So as you know, uh, the whole world is uh, now focusing on how do we accelerate things and focus on the interesting problems. And we are trying to make uh, life easier for modelers to build and scale applications, focusing on various uh, experimental use cases and also for algorithmic auditing use cases. So uh, this is a part of the winter school and uh, in the last eight to 10 weeks, uh, you must have uh, had the opportunity to listen to some various amazing talks uh, from ranging from quantum computing to Hilbert spaces to explainability and ML ops. And uh, we have a couple more sessions left in the, in the winter school before we embark uh, to the spring school, uh, we, are, uh, we are excited to partner with Premier and we are offering a couple of new courses. Uh, we have one course on algorithmic auditing and I'm very excited about this course because we are one of the first organizations to put together a whole six weeks course on algorithmic auditing. And the second course we have been working on is this notion of risk in machine learning models. We're kind of extending this whole notion of stress testing and scenario testing and evaluating these various practices and uh, all these courses are available through Premier and you get uh, professional risk credits if you take the courses through Premier. Uh, so I put in some links and I'll be sharing the slides for registered participants. If you're interested, please check them out. And also the algorithmic auditing course, it's a six week course, it starts April 1st and then the risk and machine learning uh, models uh, course starts on March 30th. So you have a couple of weeks to make a decision. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or my team, uh, you can reach out to us at info info at qsandbox.com. That is qsandbox.com. And uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions for you. So without further ado, I will uh, invite uh, our first speaker for the day. Um, so John has um, 
has, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, a significant amount of experience in the context of modern risk management. And I would like to um, offer the stage to you, John, uh, and welcome again. Thanks for making time for us. Uh, I hope uh, things are warmer in New York compared to that of Boston. Uh, so I'm going to make you the host, and uh, uh, we will start with your presentation now. <clears throat> Okay, first, Sri, I want to thank you for inviting me. I've been attending these Quant University lectures for years, but uh, so it's a privilege and an honor to be invited to give a presentation. So let me uh, share my screen. Let's get started. Um, now I want to go into um, slideshow. And let me reverse the displays here. Okay, does that look correct now? Uh, Sri, you're muted. Uh, Sri, you're muted. Everything looks good. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. you're on mute, so I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It looks good. So what I'm going to talk about today are some relatively forward-looking ideas I've worked on for several years based on a lot of frustrations that I ran into as a practicing model risk manager at a number of different investment banks. Same problems in every bank. And it occurred to me at one point that I thought I might understand why some of the methods that we use were so manual. So I'm going to propose uh, that we can make a smarter model risk management discipline by starting at the bottom of the pyramid and building smarter, smarter models. And from there, the smarter techniques will then percolate up through the uh, model risk hierarchy. Uh, I also call this an abbreviated guide for building a new generation of smart models. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by smart models uh, in, in this context. It's not the same as AI and ML models. It's based on the concept of smart devices that have been produced by tech firms for years, for decades that we're all familiar with. When we talk about smart printers or smart cars or smartphones, I'm gonna talk about smart models in very much the same way. So it's used to describe quantitative software that possesses some rudimentary form of self-awareness. And I'll explain what I mean by self-awareness. Um, let me go back. Um, I'd put it in more prosaic language, smart models are models that know who they are. If, if I can use an uh, allegory, uh, they may be, uh, this may be accomplished by embedding a unique identity token and an active intelligent agent within a model source code as described in this presentation. And as I said, this concept is really inspired by the proliferation of smart de devices. And I became very jealous of the fact that uh, Hewlett Packard and, and Tesla can track all of their devices constantly all around the world. And yet we had significant problems within an investment bank understanding how our models were being used. A few thousand of them were how and where they're being used. So the many challenges confronting today's model risk managers, I'm going to pick out five of what I consider to be the most daunting because they involve model inventory. And that's an area that tends to be very manual. Now, SR117, which I'm sure everybody knows is the, is the Bible for model risk management for all U.S. banks and all banks, uh, foreign banks uh, doing business in the U.S. It set the platform for, set the bar for model risk management back in 2011. But it, it requires banks to maintain a complete and accurate inventory of all models. It also requires banks to be able to aggregate model risk across the firm. And that's a difficult problem because it requires a, a detailed understanding of interrelationships between models and data. And understanding those interdependencies within a model ecosystem is especially problematic because mapping dependencies can rely on multiple levels of attestation. And attestation is uh, virtually the, most firms satisfy these requirements through verbal attestations by model owners and stakeholders. In other words, they raise their hand. They say, these are our models. These are the upstream dependencies. And these are some of the downstream dependencies, but we don't know all of them typically. Uh, so uh, one other way to satisfy this inventory is with an IT code search methodology, uh, which some firms do. But done diligently, manual attestation and IT code search methods will produce accurate and complete maps of model and data interdependencies if they're done completely correctly. However, those are snapshots in a point in time and become stale with time as models are introduced, new models are introduced and uh, existing models are retired. 
So to illustrate what I consider the central dilemma of understanding uh, model usage, I'm gonna present eight vexing questions that bank examiners might pose to a model risk manager about inventory. I came up with these questions because one hour before uh, a model risk discipline exam, uh, I sat down and tried to write down the questions I was most afraid of getting in the exam. And I just realized pretty quickly, none of those questions were about model validation. Firms have been doing model validation for 10 years or more. It's a pretty well-defined uh, practice now, and it's fairly mature. But I discovered that I could not answer these questions except by making phone calls. What's the exact number of different models that have been used over the last year? Second question, how often has each model been executed by day by month? Can you identify the most frequently and least frequently used models? Where, where are the firm's models being used? Can you provide a complete list of models uh, used by each of the entities over the last year, as well as all upstream and downstream model and data dependencies? Are there any models in your inventory with an active status that were not executed during the last year? That number five seems like an innocuous question, but it's actually, a, it would stump almost any model risk manager because the obvious response would be, if the model never got executed, how would we know? And why would we care? Well, you should care because if it's a model that's been, uh, an investment has been made in developing the model and it's supposed to be in production and it's not being executed, that's a red flag. And it could be a model that's been retired that's uh, still being executed, uh, that would also be a red flag. But models that are not executed should be examined because what are they doing in an inventory if they're not being used? Are there any models that were, that were executed on your firm's computers that, not, that do not appear in inventory? Uh, that may seem like a paradox, but trust me, this is a common problem. There are models uh, in many corners of a firm that don't get entered into inventory for various reasons I don't have time to go into here, but trust me, it happens. Are you able to provide a full list of the IDs of models that exhibit significant seasonality? If so, what are the peaks and troughs of usage? And lastly, were there any instances of a retired model still being executed during the last year? That too also happens. So why is it so difficult for top tier firms to give accurate quantitative answers to these questions? If I had been presented with any of those questions in a bank exam, I would have told the examiner, um, I'll get back to you tomorrow. And they'll say, why tomorrow? And I say, because everybody in Singapore is asleep right now. And uh, I'm gonna have to make some phone calls to find out what models they're using and how often. And of course, I'm just gonna get a, a qualitative estimate from them. The only way firms can answer these questions is through attestation, but these are no better than informed guesswork. And as a result, there are often discrepancies between what is an inventory and what model owners claim they own. Resolving model ownership discrepancies is very tedious and even more problematic are upstream and downstream dependencies within a firm's model ecosystem. A model owner could trace upstream dependencies with some effort, but by just following all the inputs back to their origins. But often they don't have complete knowledge of the downstream models that receive their models output as input because they don't always know who all their users are. If their model, the developer's model is in an analytic, uh, an, an analytic system, uh, there may be users that, that request that model and use it and the developers of the models would never know about it. Uh, in the age of automation, machine learning, big data, we should ask ourselves, shouldn't there be a better way uh, to ensure inventory completeness and accuracy than this manual attestation, which really is a very 20th century method. It's clumsy and error prone. And in the process, some models may be overlooked. There are some models that may be orphans while others simply fall through the cracks of antiquated monitoring systems. What do I mean by an orphan model? Uh, very often, and this is a real world problem, if you work in a bank, you, you know about this, very often the developers of a model will move on. Uh, they transfer to another part of the firm or they leave the firm and they leave their model behind. And you end up as a model risk manager going through inventory and finding here's a model that has no owners anymore. The owners are, are no longer with the firm. Nobody owns it. That's what I mean by an orphan model. Again, those things happen as well in the, in the real world. So some answers to these questions, I think, or I will argue, can be found by going to the bottom of the food chain and engaging an articulate model in a candid conversation. So this is my, my fantasy about what a conversation with a model that knows how to talk would go. On a slightly snarky model, it might go something like this. Uh, on, the, on the left, that icon is for the MRM model risk manager. It says, hey model, can we please have a little talk? Uh, models respond, sure, but you're going to regret this later. And the model risk manager says, why? My best friends are models. 
uh, the model says, because you MRM guys are not really the sharpest crayons in the box, are you? You're still living back in the stone ages. MRM says, whoa, why would you say such a thing to me? The model says, because you spend so much time and effort collecting inaccurate error prone manual attestations from model owners and users, just to inventory which models are being used and how and when. That is so 20th century. The model says, but you could make your life so much easier if you just reverse this paradigm. It's simpler, more accurate, and quite frankly, really kind of obvious. MRM says, but tell me, my friend, how can MRM possibly reverse a paradigm that has been in place for years, actually for decades? Uh, the model says the solution is all around you. It's in every smart device that you use every day in printers, cars, smartphones, smart printers, email, data networks. All you have to do is look. Uh, MRM says, I still don't get what you're driving at. The model says, okay, you're a little slow today, so listen carefully. Those devices all know who they are because they have unique IDs, or serial numbers, and a means of broadcasting, which I don't have. If you would just give me an embedded identity token and a voice, then I could tell you how, when, and where I am being used, whenever I'm being used. It's just so obvious. MRM says, now I get it. All I have to do is teach you your name and how to talk. Is that right? Um, but how would I go about doing that? And the model says, well, just follow the rest of this presentation and it'll start to sink in. So th these, there are examples all around us. I, I won't labor all this. My favorite example is um, my Hewlett Packard printer. Uh, I have a smart printer and every time I make a printout, it sends a message to Hewlett Packard Central, whatever their usage database is, telling them how many pages I printed and what my ink level is so HP can send me a new cartridge before I run out of ink. They just keep tracking my, my my, my level of ink. That's a very useful service. And they're doing this for hundreds of thousands of printers all over the world. And I started wondering, why is it HP can do this for hundreds of thousands of printers? And we have such a problem doing something like this for just several thousand models that most, the largest firms will have between two and 3,000 models in their inventory. Smaller firms, of course, much fewer models. The root cause of these difficulties isn't hard to find. Uh, no matter how sophisticated the model is, they're still not very bright when compared to an HP printer or iPhone. A smart model should be able to report who it is, how and where it's being used, and which upstream models it depends on. Designed correctly, smart models could eliminate this whole need for a manual attestation process. To understand what is missing from financial models that makes them not as smart as they could be, we only have to look a little bit deeper. Look inside the source code for any complex financial model and what will you find, regardless of what language it's written in. Well, likely you're going to see very sophisticated algorithms, efficient optimized codes, very likely using the latest concepts in object-oriented design, and perhaps code for efficient, efficient dynamic mem memory management. But there's something you won't see, at least I've looked inside hundreds of models of software for uh, the code for hundreds of models in my career, and I never saw anything that looked like this in the actual source code. Model ID equal, model version equal, model usage ID equal, and the model name. That information is always maintained external to the model. Software imitations that are classified as models always have unique IDs. That's been in place for over 10 years. And at most firms, these unique IDs, model IDs, will only appear in three places. They appear in the model documents, in the validation documents, and the inventory database as a lookup index. But where they do not appear, as I showed in the previous slide, is in the actual model source code. It's in this sense that I say models actually do not know who they are. And it can be all this model usage opacity can be traced to this single surprising blind spot in most firms' model management discipline. Adding a few pieces of information to a model can create a path to mitigating or even eliminating uh, model inventory and usage uncertainties. It's just a matter of creating smart models that are enabled to tell MRM how and where they're being used. Uh, why is there such a gap? Well, for one thing, between what model risk management needs and what model developers provide, well, Developers and validators in every firm that I'm familiar with operate in completely separate silos. In fact, independence between MRM and development is a requirement of SR 11-7. So they work completely independently within firms and they're managed and executed. Uh, in most firms, they're managed and executed a number of often incompatible uh, execution platforms. And one consequence of that silo mentality is that model developers have very little interest or motivation to modify their models to accommodate the requirements or needs of MRM. 
I'm putting this very mildly. Very often there's very strong antithesis between first and second line of defense developers and validators. So some simple changes could be made by developers if they're willing to do it to a firm's model that would greatly improve MRM discipline. Here are three of them. Create identity tokens uh, composed of that unique indicative data as I showed in uh, slide 17. Uh, next, embed an active intelligent agent to actively accurately track model usage and support creation of a dynamic model inventory. Three, exchange identity tokens between interdependent models and data to create a dynamic map of model and data dependencies. I am 99.99% .99 certain I can say no firm, no financial firm does this today, although exchange of identity tokens is a very common technique used in computer networks and email uh, in many different places. It just hasn't percolated over into finance. And I'll go into a little more detail what I mean about that. How would you use identity tokens to map um, the um, relation, the passing of, between data and models? I'm going to make an analogy to a four-person relay race with one, and I'll make one simple modification. I'm sure everybody has seen track and field events where you have four runners that pass a baton as each one, each runner covers one portion of the track and passes a baton to the next runner. I'm going to make one modification to this. In this example, each runner holds a baton of a different color. So the runner starts at one uh, with a red baton. Runner number one goes to runner number two, who has a green baton. Runner number two now leaves his mark with two batons, a red and a green baton. Uh, runner number two with a red and green baton now catch, goes to runner number three, who has a blue baton. And now runner number three carries three batons. Uh, runner number three goes to the fourth runner who has a yellow baton. And when you get to the end of the race, runner number four now has four batons of four different colors. This is exactly analogous to how passing identity tokens from upstream to downstream models would work. And as you can see from this analogy, if we replaced runner number two with say a purple baton, that would immediately be reflected at the end of this sequence. Uh, that change would be reflected immediately. That's what I mean by it's dynamically updated. If we did this uh, same operation by passing identity tokens between data and models, by the time you get to the bottom of the execution uh, sequence, you would have a complete set of the identity tokens of all upstream contributors. And that would be dynamically updated uh, every time an execution occurs. So when models are removed, they're retired, they disappear from that map. And when uh, new models are introduced, they will appear in the map that can be created from this information as, as soon as they are executed. This information can then be put into a network mapping program that will give you a graphical representation, a very nice form showing all the interrelationships with model and data. And that's the thing you need to understand in order to aggregate model risk. So finish with that. Um, so what kind of usage data might an embedded active intelligent agent send to model risk managers? Well, here I introduce the idea of the transponder. And it's really, again, I borrow this idea from aviation, just the way uh, airlines are tracked with transponder devices that bro constantly broadcast information about where they are, how fast they're going at altitude. In this case, uh, a transponder uh, for this application would want to broadcast the modeling usage IDs, the model name and version number, a timestamp, very important to understand when the model is being executed on each execution event, and an iMac, a Mac or IP address. Mac is a media access controller, which is the hardware equivalent of an IP address. So that, if a, if a firm has a, a good control over their computers, they would know uh, for a given Mac address or IP address where that computer is and who's, who's assigned to use it. So if this data is stored for every execution event, um, we would end up at the end of, say, a year, a treasure trove of model usage data that's accumulated over time. So that's the second step that's required towards the creation of a small, smarter model. First, you had unique identity token. Second, a transponder function that can transmit uh, its existence of the model every time it's executed. This data then forms a basis for that dynamic model inventory I'm talk I was talking about. So conceptually, this is very easy, simple. Uh, any model with an ID broadcasts information, this indicative data through the transponder function uh, that goes through the, um, uh, it could go through an intranet uh, into a centralized model inventory database. If intranet um, is not practical, it can also be dumped into a local temporary file. I, I mentioned that because when I presented this idea 
uh, a few years ago at a firm, the, I, the IT staff were kind of um, uh, really disturbed by my notion that I wanted to connect models to the internet because as they put it to me, they've spent years building firewalls around their models and now I want to tunnel a hole right through those firewalls. My answer was, it's internet, we own that. If it's not secure, you know, we have bigger problems. So simulation is one way to prove the concept. And I have collaborated uh, with a uh, a small firm, a consulting firm, in creating a simulation of this using um, 100 um, dummy synthetic models that just have an ID and a transponder function and with 100,000 model execution events. And the only information for the graphs I'm about to show you are the model ID, model name, timestamp, and the location. And that's the only thing required to produce uh, timeline plots of usage for any model histogram distribution of model execution frequencies and a global map showing concentration of model usage. So here's um, one, um, one platform that could be used um, to display these results. Uh, you can see uh, uh, that graph at the top is a timeline of usage of a particular model. On the lower right, uh, you see a histogram distribution of all the frequencies of model usage. This is all based on execution data, by the way. This is not a good as attestation. And in the lower left-hand corner, if you really can collect that location information, you can create a map showing where these models are being used and drill down and find out exactly which models are represented. In this representation, in this dashboard, um, the larger the, that sphere, the more execution events are associated with that location. Uh, this is the actual uh, R code for that transponder function. I only show this, um, some of you may be code wonks who are interested in this, I only show it to show you, it's actually quite simple. A dozen lines of code. Uh, is this code uh, available online or is that something uh, people can request you in case they um, are... this is um This was written for R. Okay. So I can certainly make, I mean, <laughs> uh, anybody who gets a copy of this uh, presentation will have the code right there if they're interested. Okay. okay. But I don't have it in a file online. This was um, by a firm called FI Consulting for me. And uh, they, they created that, that dashboard uh, using Amazon um, web interface. But um, they will be very happy to share this information with you because they're really interested in seeing other people use it. So I, I can, you can see FI Consulting Arlington, Virginia at the bottom. If you contact them and give them my name, I, I think they'd be happy to share this. Uh, so now I get to the bottom, the takeaway. Embedding identity tokens and intelligent agents into models can reverse that tedious manual attestation paradigm. Uh, right now, uh, owners and users, uh, MRM relies on owners and users providing a complete set of models through this manual attestation. It's just easier and more accurate to teach the models how to tell us how, when, and where they're being used. Uh, the most important takeaway from this presentation is that any usage tracking solution should reside inside the model code. Why do I say inside the model code? Because in all firms that I know of today, this kind of monitoring is done external to the model by execution environments. Therefore, it's not portable across different execution environments and it's not scalable. Once it's inside the model, it's both scalable and portable. It goes wherever the model goes and it only has to be done once. I call it embed it and forget it. You embed that information in the model code, source code once and forget about it. It doesn't have any impact on performance. Um, advantages, um, it's readily scalable. It's a comprehensive solution. It's incremental. That is, you don't have to do all models all at once. It can be done one set of models at a time. And it creates a platform that creating a dynamically dynamic trace of model and data interdependencies. The disadvantages are that it touches every model. Uh, it could create high bandwidth from heavily used models, but that's a problem that can be solved. If vendor models present a special challenge because vendors are not gonna install this information in their source code, but very few firms call vendor models directly. They call them from a host program and that's where it can be done. And the EUC models also uh, are, can prevent, present special challenges, but they can be uh, overcome. Yeah, the biggest problem is that most large established firms tend to be resistant to change, especially innovations, expect pushback from IP, which I personally have experienced. So I'll end with this. It's no longer just vaporware. Uh, I've been talking about this for two years, but the SAS Institute is actually Im implementing a version of this in their MRM platform. Uh, they, it's in a prototype stage and it's being tested with a few other clients. And so SAS Institute uh, actually uses the same uh, representation or 
uh, uses the, the, the same model of a uh, relay race to, to explain how token passing can track out uh, trace the dynamic interrelationships represented by that network diagram at the bottom. So I also see it like David is on um, on the call. So David uh, could potentially be reached in case uh, we could extend this discussion on how SAS implements it. Um, so uh, I think Krishna, welcome. Uh, I think Krishna has also joined. Uh, he's joining in from uh, California, and they've 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 kind of had a, a a different take in how the whole machine learning and AI revolution has brought about this need for not just looking at models, but the entire life cycle for models, right? And then you have to think about monitoring and tooling and factor in primarily from a, the frontier models or the machine learning perspective aspects of AI and machine learning. Um, so uh, before we jump into the fireside chat, um, so Krishna, welcome. And do you wanna introduce your company before we can, uh, we can dive into our, our fireside chat? And John, uh, I, every time I you know, see your presentation, I get like 15 different ideas I would like to build upon your thoughts. And it always like, you know, uh, feels like you're, you're kind of uh, seeing the world on how it should be in 2050 with old model risk management. Uh, but we are still trying to like, you know, get, get the act together and get everything in place. So I'd love to kind of have a follow on discussion with you on how we can, you know, extend some of the the frameworks you've been building and see how we could potentially operationalize it. Um, so Krishna, welcome again, and uh, I will make you the presenter. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Shri. Uh, thanks, John. I, and I also saw John's presentation previously. It's great. And um, sorry for uh, joining late. Uh, there's a calendar mishap. So cool. So let me share my screen. Great. So, um, so I'm Krishna. I'm the founder CEO of Fiddler. Um, we are a, a startup in the Bay Area. We're working on explainable AI and machine learning monitoring. And uh, this talk is about, how, you know, introducing this new concept of uh, uh, this model performance management and how it can help you uh, to sort of uh, validate and monitor your models you know, throughout their life cycle. So a brief background about the company. Uh, we are a bunch of technologists in the Bay Area. We've built AI platforms and especially explainable AI in our previous companies. I was working at Facebook uh, prior to starting Fiddler uh, for a few years where I was working on explainable AI for newsfeed uh, and, and showing uh, rec you know, explanations for recommendations that you see on newsfeed. You know, things like, why am I seeing this post? What are the reasons I'm seeing this post? And, and so on and so forth. And this platform was used by developers as well as you know uh, end users in in, in newsfeed. And 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 Fiddler, I, we're basically uh, working on a, a general purpose uh, explainable AI platform that offers you know machine learning monitoring and 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 model diagnostics. And and we are backed by, by some really good investors and you know and some really good employees have joined us. So the problem we are trying to solve, and as you as you as you probably have identified from John's presentation as well, is you know, people are deploying machine learning models all over the place, right? And and we work with like, you know, uh, financial services companies, but also a lot of other other type of, you know, companies. You know, you'd see that, you know, machine learning is just percolating across the board. And I think we see that there are four main problems coming, coming um, you know, uh, when they're doing it. One is obviously more and more models these days are like kind of black box models. It's very hard to understand what they're what they're what they what they're doing, you know how they're predicting, and then uh, models performance can change over time, and uh, this has actually uh, got exacerbated with coronavirus. Uh, there were a lot of teams that actually experienced uh, where where they trained a machine learning model with pre-coronavirus data, and uh, and when they and they were still running that model on post-coronavirus, like essentially uh, after the COVID nineteen happened. Um, you know, the model performance degraded quite rapidly and they didn't have good ways to you know, monitor it and understand it. And, and so early warning systems like to be able to understand when models, model performance deteriorates is becoming an important topic in machine learning operations today. The third is model bias. A couple of years ago, if you followed uh, the incident that happened with Apple credit card where, 
you know, Apple launched this uh, credit card to set automatic credit limits for users and, and users complained saying that they in the, within the same household, uh, you know, uh, they, they were finding really egregiously uh, bad, uh, you know, credit limit differences between husband and wife, you know, almost like 10 times difference between the credit limit set for a husband and compared to the wife. And so these kind of issues, obviously, when when they happen in a regulated environment, that could actually lead to you know heavy fines and whatnot. So the core problem that we see today in in in, in sort of uh, in the industry is that as these models are getting deployed, they are touching not just the model owner, right? So and and especially in a bank like system, you know, it could be a risk management team that is actually dealing with them. These models could have some business users. Um, it could have you know. Eventually, the AI-based products could have customer support teams, um, you know, that are responsible for it. And so, what happens is when you have these models becoming the primary, you know, uh, sort of citizens uh, that are uh, making decisions uh, for your business workflows, it starts to affect beyond people beyond the model owner. And so, therefore, you know, not having visibility, not having understanding how they work, uh, is actually a big problem today. So. How it manifests, in fact, is 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 as I, I sort of is because of this very simple workflow that a lot of um, a lot of ML teams follow today. So today, you know, a lot of teams have this very simple linear workflow where they train a model and they deploy the model and they start predicting, you know, how the model is actually um, like they basically start predicting on new data. What happens is. This basically, uh, the model itself could be a black box if it's like a very you know complex model. You know, uh, let's say you're picking like a deep learning model for anti-money laundering or or whatnot. Uh, or it could be you know you don't have a feedback loop when you're actually making predictions, and so therefore, you know it it's very hard to operate and it's very hard to control its performance. So like what happens today is with this with this this sort of uh, uh, pipeline where you have this offline uh, pipeline that creates the model and an online pipeline that actually uh, does the inferences, you get into a lot of discrepancies between data. So your features created here may not be existing here, or they may, they, they may be absent here. And therefore, you know, that could actually hurt model performance. And then that could be like, you know, causing data drift in your, in your models. And then your, if your model itself is not, um, you know, checked for, you know, all kinds of, you know, issues prior to deployment, let's say if it's carrying bias or whatnot, especially if it's not run on your, you know, prediction log, it can carry, you know, uh, un unwanted bias and whatnot. And then not having ability to observe the model, you know, could like lead to, you know, performance issues. You may have, un you know, uh, you know, unexpected outliers, you know, coming through the model, pro model predictions. And so therefore there are a whole number of problems that make these machine learning models error prone in their, in their deployment today. So how do we solve it? You know, if we basically took a first principles approach and, and took a step back and how other people have solved this, this problem in industrial systems, right? So there is this beautiful mathematical concept called control theory that actually helps us, you know, ground this thing and how to solve, uh, how, how to basically, you know, observe and monitor and control a system. So essentially a control, the <coughs> sorry, control theory basically is a, is a is a way to is a way to sort of manage a system it could be any system and it's a way to sort of or you know make sure that the system is producing the desired outputs by its inputs so let's see how it actually you know works in real world right so for example you know there are uh, you know there are two kinds of systems in control theory one is an open loop system we have a lot of these open loop systems in our house and in our you know regular day to day life um, you know, for a classic example is like a dishwasher is an open loop system where you load it with, with a set of dishes and you set a timer, which is the input. And then it basically runs for that time and it produces clean dishes, right? It's pretty simple. Your only control into the dishwasher is the time that you set. Similarly, you're basically trying to drive a car and, uh, and you don't have any sort of uh, automatic cruise control. So you're basically, you know, pressing the glass pedal, which is basically the input and it controls the speed, which is the output. These are very simple open loop systems where the input itself is not dependent on the output and there's like a manual intervention here. The problem with open loop systems is that, you know, when the environment changes, 
then uh, you know the systems cannot adjust to environment. So, for example, if I'm pressing the same amount of um, you know on the gas pedal on my car, and the speed, the desired speed of the car would vary depending if the car is actually climbing a hill versus a valley, right? I mean, so if it's going on a valley, the desired obviously the speed of the car would accelerate. Uh, if it's going on a hill, it would basically decelerate for the same amount of gas pedal input. So therefore, it's harder to sort of you know make the open loop systems adjust uh, to the environment on their own. What we need is what, what we call this feedback control, where you're constantly observing the outputs. So you know, imagine having a sensor that is constantly observing this output, and then providing a feedback that takes like some sort of a desired reference that the user wants, like we want, and then controls the input. So we then introduce these two components, like the sensor and the controller, that are actually looking at the output and then converting into a feedback, and then basically you know, using it with coupling it to the desired reference to control the input. And so this kind of a, a setup could help us manage the system to have like the desired output all the time. How does this work with the, with the, with the car example? You know, we do have it with, for example, you have a speedometer that's actually observing the speed of the car. It's translating into some sort of a feedback that couples it with the desired speed and feeds it to the cruise control. And cruise control basically guides the gas pedal so that you are actually maintaining the desired speed. This is, this is how cruise control works, right? So how does it work for machine learning in, in systems? So if we, we, machine learning systems don't have this feedback control right now, right? If we do have a feedback controller, how would it look like? So feedback controller, would basically help us, you know, given a machine learning model, it helps you validate the model, it helps you analyze the model. And then when the model is actually running, it helps you monitor it. And so that it can actually be, you know, all the decisions can be, you know, uh, fed back to the improvements of the model. So a real workflow uh, for this could actually make the models, you know, from black box to the white, uh, to kind of, you know, not so black box anymore. So in, 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 in terms of like how it actually can influence the workflow is, Imagine having a feedback controller at the heart of like your ML lifecycle. And, and we call it, you know, this whole model performance uh, management uh, system that can actually look at your training data and actually uh, understand and check, check for bias or feature quality issues that can actually, you know, explain the performance of the models that, that you can actually store all the models and all the metadata around it. And then you can discover slices of low model performance. Um, that can help you record the traffic and help you like you know compare challenger champion models that can actually monitor the performance of the models on a continuous basis and then that can actually analyze you know performance issues help you analyze performance issues and then feed and then sort of uh, connect it back to your training cycle so they actually train it so it's actually not doing any of these core things. You still have to train your model. You still have to deploy your model. You still have to score your model. But it's sitting at the heart of the ML lifecycle and providing you uh, with these insights uh, so that you are controlling the um, ML lifecycle so that you're building the right models for your users and for your organization. So that's, that's, what, uh, that's what we are basically um, you know, introducing uh, with this concept of model performance management. And uh, it's 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 inspired by this control theory, and it, it's the aim is to help like the a modeler and the, and the associated people to have full transparency into the models and ability to control the models uh, throughout the life cycle. So that's that's kind of what I wanted to talk about, and I'm happy to take any questions and you know get into um, the panel discussion. Thank you, Oh, thank you so much, Krishna. This was an excellent orientation on uh, what you guys have been working on. Um, so, <clears throat> so John, um, you know, you had uh, uh, kind of you know presented your view on how you know the whole transponder and the smart model uh, philosophy would work, and uh, you know, Krishna is operationalizing it in the context of control theory. Uh, now, one question I always get when we work with our customers are like, you know, well, we have the machine learning models, and then we have the traditional statistical models. So how do we integrate all these together? Because you know, they seem to have different workflows. Any thoughts? Um, sure, I can offer one right away. <laughs> um, this stream of information that the transponder function would provide could form a feedback loop. It gets fed back into the uh, source of the model and the model could self-modify depending on 
what that information is. You know, density of usage or even location. You, you may know that um, the same model may have different uh, bespoke versions for different regions of the world, different global entities, because the, the, local, the global regulators, the local regulators in different countries all have different requirements. So a given model may have five different versions. And uh, one thing this thing could track very clearly is the right version of the model being used in the right location. And that could be part of the feedback. You know, oops, wrong model. Then it could self-modify itself to the correct version. Uh, I'm just throwing out some ideas here, but I could see how this transponder information could be part of the feedback loop. Yeah. And Krishna, the same question to you. Are you guys just focusing on the AI ML model side of the story, or you're kind of thinking about integrating with the traditional models also? And how would it work if you're yeah. trying to build the monitoring layer for traditional models? Right. I think today we are focused on the machine learning models, um, mainly for two reasons. We believe that uh, the industry as a whole is, is there's a lot of you know uh, push towards moving to machine learning models, right? And there's uh, there's availability of a lot of data sets, and you know you know a lot of people have uh, tools, and this emergence of citizen data scientists as well is sort of uh, causing it. The other interesting thing about machine learning models, in my opinion, are there are two main things. I, I don't know if quant quantitative models suffer from it. One is machine learning model is a black box, right? You cannot really open up and like lead, read the equations. And so it makes it a unique entity or at least you know, su sufficiently complex machine learning model. Maybe not a simple model, but a sufficiently complex one. It makes, it's, it's, an un it's hard to understand. And number two is it has this you know variability in its performance right you, you can you could have trained the model you know on your, on your old data and it actually can change you know if your data distribution is changed in your production it's pre, its prediction performance is it's probably unexpected but as a quantitative model some of those uh, you know uh, probably bottlenecks are taken away that you know if you, if you can you can understand the code you can actually really really know what's going on you still need to monitor it for sure um, but I guess like, um, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of what makes machine learning models unique. And, and so our focus is right now on machine learning model monitoring. Absolutely. And one of the uh, practical aspects which I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is bridging this knowledge gap. You know, we have you know, on the customer side or you know, people who are building and using these models, uh, you, they have the context and uh, they really understand the boundaries of where their models will work really well and they're looking for opportunities to augment their processes and that's the reason why they're trying to figure out more data-driven models and machine learning models. Um, but on the other hand, they don't have the concepts because everything is new and uh, you know you can't just hire you know more PhDs to come in and you know start looking at a new, you know whole new workflow altogether. I mean large organizations could potentially afford but Many organizations are trying to like upskill themselves from where they are, and you know you guys are putting together all these tooling, uh, you know, to help bridge that gap. But I still am always like concerned, you know, are we providing them just an instruction manual without contextualizing it to the exact use cases? And if so, how do we bridge that gap? I mean. We are looking at this whole area of algorithmic auditing, wherein you know we, are, we acknowledge that everybody cannot build that skills, and you basically need to go through the process of bringing in the experts to kind of do the due diligence and understand, provide qualified opinions on various aspects. Do you see that as a way to go about it, or do you think the tools will mature enough that it's going to be self-serve and you just need to plug and play, and things are going to happen? How do you see the world moving? And maybe Krishna, you can start with, and then John you can share your thoughts. Absolutely. So I think, you know, uh, I think today there are, uh, in fact, three problems, right? You know, you have, you know, sort of uh, tools problem, you have like the lack of process problem that you mentioned. You also, in some cases, you know, people are not skilled enough, you know, in some cases to actually use these tools. So, so I think, you know, from our perspective, we are, oh, we could, we are you know, because we are, we are a technology startup, we are, solve, we are solving the tools problem. We want to make the tool as simple as possible. And, and, but then it's up to the organizations to institutionalize this process, you know, of responsible AI or, or all of these, you know, you know, this whole frameworks being thrown out, you know, these are the things, these are five things that you need to do, or these are 98 problems that you will run into with respect to operationalizing machine learning models, all kinds of, you know, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, things are, uh, things are being put out now. So it's up to the organizations to think about how do I have an AI governance process? 
or or whatever you want to call it um, that can help you know my machine learning engineers or modelers build the right type of models and reduce the risk for my organization but also maximize you know the ROI and the reason why people are moving to AI and ML is because the efficiency the ROI the impact that it can provide you know and we are working with banks where you know we see that uh, uh, you know, very good model could increase um, a single digit percentage on like their, you know, credit underwriting, which could be, you know, millions of dollars, right? And so, and so how do we then do, how to do it right, such that you don't get into the uh, situations like what happened with Apple Card or, or any other other company, some sort of a brand risk issue or a regulatory risk issue, right? And so that, I think, you know, banks already do that really nicely with with, with quantitative models, right? And, and the nice thing about it is in financial institutions, they have pretty well-defined regulations, they have pretty well-defined processes with respect to MRM for quant models. What we are basically introducing is, hey, you have this new kind of beast coming in, which is the machine learning model, and you need you still also need to manage it and you still need to govern it and monitor it. And, and it, the existing tools may not work for that effectively. And here's a new tool to, inst- to kind of introduce into your process uh, to kind of manage the machine learning models. And so that's, for us, it's actually much easier to uh, talk to banks because they already know the process. Whereas to other companies that are not so much aware with like this whole process of model governance, it's, we have to not only, you know, t- teach the tool, but also think about them or teach them the process. Hey, you know, you need to th- do these things throughout your life cycle. You know, otherwise your models could be at risk. Yeah. John, you want to add something quick? Uh, I think there's also an audience question to, to that. Yeah. Um, Sure. Um, in general, I'm almost going to paraphrase um, um, someone from the, the, the FRB um, um, on, on this topic. Uh, because we don't understand uh, machine learning models very well, or they, they tend to be opaque, it's going to require, um, from the modelist management point of view, much more intensive monitoring and more careful scrutiny of the multiple forms of data uh, that go into these. You've got these ML models have a huge appetite for data. And a lot of them use alt data sources, which are less of, of a lesser quality than the standard quant model data sources in, in many cases. And that requires special scrutiny. Of course, an, a good ML model should be able to assess the quality of input data. That could be a, a separate function. Um, I, I would like to also raise one other thing about this lack of understanding of machine learning models. It's been a very recent example that some of you may be familiar with in the airline industry. When COVID-19 first hit, the programs, the machine learning programs that were used to balance uh, price, ticket price versus customer demand versus ticket sales were optimized to perform on historic data on the relationship between price and demand. And when COVID hit, uh, suddenly demand went down dramatically. So the machine learning models did what they were trained to do. They started dropping prices, still no increase in demand. So they dropped prices even further, still no increase in demand. So the prices went you know, all the way to the floor. So now you see 29.95 to go across the country because they don't read the newspapers. Uh, this is it's still machine learning models, no matter how clever they might be, still have a silo kind of nature that they don't have a comprehensive awareness of the world around them. If they read the newspapers or listened to n- news broadcasts, they would have known there's another factor that's completely changed the dynamic, which is the pandemic and nobody's traveling anymore. But mm-hmm. This applies to quant models as well, by the way, but machine models, learning models potentially uh, may have the ability to have a more comprehensive knowledge of what's going on in society or culture and make that connection. I don't see that happening anytime soon, though, because they're trained on data sets. Um, but I, I'd like to throw that example out because it really points a uh, highlights a weakness in, in these models that they depend on. And I think that similar uh, example, like kind of right at that Stitch Fix also had a similar situation when it came down to, you know, using machine learning and other models for routing various routers. Um, so I, I think there's also an audience question. I'm also mindful of the time we're getting close to things. So uh, Satya, uh, he's dialing in from Singapore. So he had a question. Satya, you want to go ahead? Satya, do you hear us? Do you want to go ahead? Okay, doesn't seem there like- There was uh, one question that one gentleman asked. I couldn't um, answer it. So someone asked if Fiddler uses 
Shapley values or other such methods. Yes, we do use uh, Shapley values, PDP, all kinds of you know, traditional methods to explain machine learning models. We have some of our custom algorithms as well uh, that are proprietary for Fiddler. You know, happy to chat more about it. Please visit fiddler.ai for more questions. Absolutely. So uh, this this was, I wish we could have extended the session to a longer duration, but uh, um, this was a very interesting and I'm so glad that you both were able to like you know, join us today. Um, and just a couple of parting thoughts. You know, we have uh, you know, covered a lot of different sessions on explainability, on uh, machine learning interpretability, and MLOps, and uh, looking at uh, model risk management, both from a theoretical perspective and also from a practitioner's perspective. But the more I kind of you know, listen to the varied perspectives, I realize we're still just scratching the surface. You know, it's kind of you know, uh, thinking about the whole automotive industry, right? Like 100 years ago, there were so many approaches and people were figuring out both from a product perspective on how to build better, faster, cheaper, safer cars, but also figuring out like what process should we use to build out this whole mechanism. And I think machine learning and model risk management itself is in the stage of infancy. And um, obviously there's a plethora of approaches and tools and uh, you know, as the dust settles and we gear towards more and more integration of these, uh, you know, services, not in isolation as separate entities, but as a part of what we do in our daily lives, I think we're going to see a lot more maturity, but it's a very uh, exciting field to be in. And especially, and that's why we are kind of, you know, focusing on building educational programs and also uh, building in that thought leadership aspects of it so that we can treat it as a disciplined practice rather than thinking of it as just another thing which we have to just plug into our you know in our day-to-day -day process so i'm so glad that you were able to participate in this uh, session krishna and john i really appreciate your thoughts uh, for people in the audience uh, we have a couple more sessions left in this uh, uh, winter school next week uh, francesca lazari from microsoft she's going to be talking about time series forecasting and she's been working a lot on uh, uh, ML Azure and a couple of other things. And I thought uh, it would be nice to kind of, you know, bring in the machine learning approach to forecasting, especially in the financial services world, wherein there's a lot of time series related data sets and how uh, the forecasting aspects of it could be brought in. So we'll have a wonderful session next week. And the week after that, uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Holm, who also is a colleague of uh, uh, you know, John at uh, NYU, so he's going to be presenting on alternative data. So he wrote an amazing paper, which is available on SSRN. So that's going to be uh, the next two sessions. Uh, it's both on Wednesdays from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, so for people uh, who were asking for the slides for today's session, uh, so Krishna, if you can share any of those yes. slides, I can send it out to the audience. Uh, John, you already sent me the slides, so I'm going to package them and then we'll make them available to QRAT Academy. Uh, for people who don't know, you know, we have this learning portal called QRAT Academy wherein we have been collecting all the, uh, you know, the summer and the winter and the spring school sessions and we have put everything in one portal. So feel free to, uh, I put in as a message in the uh, Q&A session. So please feel free to register so that you can access all the sessions in one place. Uh, so thanks again for making the time for us and uh, I hope to see you again in another week at the next edition of the Quant University Guest Lecture Series. Thank you so much.